Today on Brain Bites with Dr. B, I'm talking about specific medications, Zoloft, Prozac, Lexapro, and Effexor XR, and what's so special about them. Let's dig in. So I'd like to discuss the thought process behind my decisions when I'm helping patients choose medications. The first thing I want to know is the mental health symptoms and diagnoses. Because if it's not something that I think an SSRI or an SNRI will help with, then it doesn't belong in this talk. But in most cases, one of these medication classes will be appropriate for anxiety, depression, or trauma symptoms. The only tricky piece here is if someone has bipolar depression. It is not recommended that they take an SSRI or SNRI without a mood stabilizer, and sometimes not at all, because of the potential switch to mania. So when I say depression here, it's for unipolar depression. And even more than just symptoms and diagnoses, I want to know how the person feels about taking medications. Did their mom start Paxil and she felt so much better? Or did their best friend take Prozac and Zoloft and hate them both? And deciding to take daily medications like SSRIs requires a commitment. Once someone is stable on their dose of medication for over six months, preferably up to a year, then we can talk about a slow taper off of the medication to make sure their physiology can keep up and they don't need to take it anymore. So I usually expect an eight to 12 month commitment to taking medication up front. This is the direction we're trying to go. Then, of course, if there are any medical conditions or other medications prescribed, I want to be sure that we're making medication choices that won't worsen any other problems and will interact as minimally as possible with other medications. In many cases, because the SSRIs are all so similar, I will have to consider a different class of medications if these are contraindicated for a certain patient. It's always important to be aware of chronic GI issues, migraines, and their treatments, bleeding disorders, and certain specific heart conditions. And of course, then the risk of increased blood pressure with Effexor. Assuming a person doesn't have anything they already want to try or avoid and don't have other medical or medication reasons that limit our choices, I will almost always start with Lexapro. It's the cleanest medication since it's the only active part of the chemical and there are no other known actions at any other neurotransmitter sites. I can go as low as five milligrams and a person with a pill cutter can start as low as two and a half milligrams. If there's not enough effect at the maximum dose, it's usually easy to switch directly to another SSRI without decreasing the dose or worsening side effects. Zoloft would be my second pick for a well-tolerated first choice. There is broad dosing, so it can be easier to find just the right dose without someone getting more medication than they want. Sometimes I see a little more stomach upset with this medication than with Lexapro, but they're both well-tolerated when started at low doses. Prozac is my favorite when I feel like someone needs a stronger medication. Equivalence isn't an exact science here, but in many cases, if a patient doesn't get a great effect with a higher dose of Zoloft or Lexapro, Prozac may be just the thing. I also think the extra dopamine and norepinephrine action, even though it's fairly small, can be very helpful for some people. Prozac dosing usually tops out at 60 milligrams, but in some cases where someone needs more effect and isn't having side effects, it can go higher. This can be a very effective medication, but I don't often start with this because there's less flexible dosing. It's a capsule, so it can't be cut. And sometimes the early GI side effects can be really pronounced. A lot more people complain about feeling jittery or anxious during the first week or two as well. I just don't see that as much with Lexapro or Zoloft, which is why that's where I start and then switch to Prozac if we need to. Finally, a Effexor is a fantastic medication, but it isn't right for everyone. The norepinephrine is very helpful for some people, especially those with that slowed down anhedonic depression or dysthymia. And even though it's generally helpful for anxiety disorders, it can be activating and uncomfortable the first few weeks while the body adjusts to that extra norepinephrine. One of the main reasons I hold off on this medication, though, is that it can be harder to come off of due to antidepressant discontinuation syndrome. I explain this to patients ahead of time, but in general, if we're just looking at a year or so of projected treatment, this will be lower on my list than an SSRI. But this is not an exact system, and I don't know how each unique body and brain will react to a certain medication. Our understanding of mental health medications is not exact yet. It's important to know that doing less than stellar on one medication for a month does not mean that another medication in the same class won't help. There are plenty of times where the first choice just doesn't work out as well as suspected, but the second choice is great. 
It takes time to figure out how someone will respond long term. And until we learn more, we probably won't know exactly why people respond differently to similar medications. I'm going to run through some specific information about the three most commonly prescribed SSRIs and Lexapro, because that's my favorite, and then Effexor as the SNRI. As an aside, I will say the trade names most often, even though all of these medications are available as generics. Just find the trade names easier to say and spell. Starting with Zoloft, the most prescribed mental health medication in the U.S., Zoloft is the trade name and sertraline is the generic name of this medication, which was approved by the FDA in 1991. Zoloft is an SSRI, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, that is also thought to have some weak action at dopamine and norepinephrine receptors. Even though these other sites don't have a lot of really strong action, in certain people, it can contribute to either greater effect, if there's more than just a problem with serotonin, or cause more side effects since there are more neurotransmitters involved. Zoloft has been FDA approved to treat major depressive disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, panic disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, social anxiety disorder, and premenstrual dysphoric disorder, and is frequently used to treat generalized anxiety disorder with good effects too. Zoloft is typically dosed between 25 and 200 milligrams daily, and most of my patients are on an intermediate dose of 50 to 150 with good effects and minimal side effects. It is recommended to reduce the dose gradually to minimize antidepressant discontinuation syndrome and relapsing symptoms. And the half-life of Zoloft is about 26 hours. Zoloft's most common side effects are nausea, diarrhea, insomnia, fatigue, tremor, decreased libido, and hyperhidrosis, or lots of sweating. In my patients, I tend to see mostly upset stomach as the most common side effect, and this usually goes away within the first week of taking it. I also see occasional issues with libido. I love Zoloft for all of the dosing options and the fact that it's really well tolerated. This is the second most common SSRI that I start for patients that are new to medications or very sensitive to side effects. This medication is also great to switch to or from when on a different SSRI that isn't working or isn't well tolerated. Let's go to Prozac. Prozac, generic name fluoxetine, is one of my favorite medications and was FDA approved in 1987. It's an SSRI with weak inhibition of norepinephrine, but also has some other weak actions at a bunch of other receptors, including muscarinic, histaminergic, and alpha-1 adrenergic receptors. Again, those extra actions are often two-sided, providing more benefit for some patients and more side effects for others. Prozac is FDA-approved to treat major depressive disorder, obsessive-compulsive disorder, bulimia nervosa, panic disorder, and when combined with olanzapine, it's good for bipolar depression and treatment-resistant depression. It's also been marketed as a treatment for premenstrual dysphoric disorder. I also find it effective for generalized anxiety disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder, even though it doesn't have those specific FDA indications. Prozac is typically dosed from 20 milligrams up to a max of 60 or 80 milligrams, and its half-life is four to 16 days. Prozac's most common side effects are nausea, headaches, insomnia, nervousness, anxiety, somnolence or feeling sleepy, diarrhea, dizziness, and tremor. According to the FDA, the most common reason for stopping Prozac is anxiety or nervousness. I also commonly see this in my patients, and some also complain of issues with libido. Some people will also report feeling numb, which might sound better than depression or anxiety, but in actuality, most people find that feeling numb is worse. And finally, my favorite, Lexapro deserves its own highlight because it's that good. This is not one of the top three SSRIs prescribed yet, but I think it's becoming more common because it's so well tolerated. Lexapro, the generic is escitalopram, was approved in 2002. It's the cleanest SSRI we have, meaning there are no other actions at any other sites besides serotonin. That means a lower risk of side effects for most people, which is why I love prescribing this medication first. It's also very easy to switch from Lexapro to another SSRI if there are side effects or someone doesn't have a very good response. Lexapro is approved for major depressive disorder and generalized anxiety disorder, but also used for other anxiety, depressive, and trauma disorders, and can be helpful for premenstrual dysphoric disorder. It's usually dosed 5 to 20 milligrams daily, but most people can tolerate up to 30 milligrams if they need a higher dose, and it has a half-life of about 
27 to 32 hours. The most commonly observed side effects from Lexapro are nausea, insomnia, diarrhea, dry mouth, somnolence, feeling sleepy, and flu-like symptoms. For many of my patients, they have no side effects at all when starting this medication. The most common problems I hear about, though, are upset stomach, fatigue, problems with libido, and feeling numb. The only SNRI I'm discussing is Effexor because I think it's the best and people can usually get it from their insurance without issues. I'm discussing Effexor XR, which is venlafaxine ER, approved in 1997. There's an immediate release version, but that's not as commonly prescribed. Effexor is a serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, meaning it strongly affects the serotonin and norepinephrine systems, but it also has some weak actions on dopamine. It's FDA approved for major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder, panic disorder, and also recommended for treating PTSD by the Veterans Administration. The usual starting dose for Effexor XR is 75 milligrams, but the capsules are available as low as 37.5 milligrams. 225 milligrams is the max, and this is usually taken in the morning due to the activating qualities of norepinephrine. The half-life is very short at just around 11 hours. The most common side effects reported with Effexor XR are nausea, insomnia, dizziness, somnolence or feeling sleepy, dry mouth, and sweating. And in some people, it can also cause an elevation in blood pressure. For my patients, I typically see side effects related to the norepinephrine part of the medication, so activation, feeling jittery, a little more anxious, or having trouble sleeping. Many people respond really well to this medication, but it has more interactions with other medications, so we just have to be thoughtful with our choices. There are a lot of different ways to prescribe multiple medications, but the risk of serotonin syndrome increases when multiple medications that act on this system are added together. It's also not recommended that patients are currently on multiple SSRIs or SNRIs at the same time, unless it's a brief cross titration from one medication to another. Which brings us to one of the biggest risks of taking these types of medications, serotonin syndrome. This is a rare condition that comes from having too much serotonin in the body. If someone is taking multiple medications that block the serotonin transporters, the amount of serotonin will increase, sometimes to unsafe levels. Serotonin syndrome is potentially life-threatening, and a trip to the ER is recommended if someone takes an SSRI or other serotonergic medication and experiences these symptoms. Mental status changes like agitation, hallucinations, delirium, and coma. Autonomic instability, so tachycardia, increased heart rate. A blood pressure that is variable, dizziness, diaphoresis or sweating, flushing, feeling very hot. Neuromuscular symptoms like tremor or rigidity, hyperreflexia or incoordination, even seizures, but also gastrointestinal symptoms, so nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. This is most likely to occur with the use of other serotonergic drugs. The other major risk people worry about is the black box warning for SSRIs and SNRIs that lists an increased risk in suicidality in people under 24 years old. This is a risk that was noted during large trials of these medications decades ago that found some people initially started on antidepressants would sometimes feel suicidal. This is a known risk of antidepressants that we're not sure where it's coming from. In general, as long as patients are aware of the risks, it is almost always preferable to treat the depression, which in itself is a strong predictor for suicidal thoughts and actions than to avoid them because of this potential risk. But it's important to monitor for clinical worsening, suicidality, and unusual changes in behavior, especially during the initial few months of treatment or following dose changes. The other major risk with medications that block serotonin is in patients with a bipolar mood disorder. Antidepressant medications can increase the likelihood that a person may switch into mania, which is a medical and mental health emergency. The general recommendation is that patients with bipolar disorder should not be on an SSRI or SNRI as monotherapy and preferably avoided if possible. What a set of downers. Well, one great thing about these medications overall is that for most people, they are weight neutral, meaning people who take them aren't expected to gain or lose weight due to the characteristic of these medications. It's not that way for everyone, but for most people, a change in weight is not likely or at least not due to the medication. Although the SSRIs are similar, they are not interchangeable. 
there are specific, if nuanced, differences in what medication may be a better fit for one person over another, whether starting something new or switching from one SSRI to another or an SNRI. I hope you've found this to provide a deeper understanding of the way that these medications work and how they impact treatment time, response, side effects, and risks. I'm Dr. Jessica Bichkovsky, your friendly online psychiatrist. Cheers to healthy brains through insight and data.